Okay, so thanks to Wendy for that great children's sermon as well. Um, today we are talking about following Jesus while imprisoned by conflicting perceptions of reality, which is kind of what her story touched on when people have two different perspectives. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit more of um, what if the perspectives are not equal? What if they're not both morally equal? And how do we judge that kind of thing? That's what we're going to talk about today. But we do live in this world where people disagree. People disagree on the basic aspects of reality. And at first I was going to call this conflicting worldviews, but it's really more than that. Today people just don't just disagree about how to view the world, but how to view just reality itself. People today can look at the same fact and believe two completely different things. So to unpack that idea a little bit, we're going to talk about a specific example that's in the news right now called QAnon. QAnon. Now, for some of us, this may be the first time hearing about QAnon. And for others, we've heard the name or perhaps only recently become aware of this movement. We've become aware of it due to increased media coverage, perhaps, and to the president recently saying that QAnon are people who, quote, like me very much, and who, quote, love our country. These comments are reminiscent of his evaluation of Nazis marching in Charlottesville as very good people. So who or what is QAnon? It's kind of complicated. It is an anonymous person, or it could be a group of people, who post messages on internet message boards under the username QAnon or Q. It's also the people who follow and believe the words of this person who posts these messages. So it's the person and it's the followers. Chris Salizov with CNN says, QAnon is a baseless conspiracy theory organized around the idea that Q, a supposed high level government official that some of the conspiracies believers think is Trump himself, is sprinkling clues on the internet message boards about a series of massive deep state conspiracies at work in the country. Q followers believe, among other things, that Trump was recruited by the military to run for president in 2016 because he alone was not beholden to the secret power brokers of the world and could break the hold that they have on American society and that the likes of Hillary Clinton will be rounded up in a mass arrest for alleged crimes against society. Okay. In the New York Times, Jeffrey Cava Service writes, the conspiracists without a shred of proof declared Democrats to be part of a deep state cobble of satanic child molesting cannibals and call for the president, president to imprison and execute them. Okay. Another reporter, Caitlin Beatty, writing for the Religious News Services, documents other conspiracy theories linked to this group. That 5G radio waves are used for mind control. That George Floyd's murder is a hoax. That Bill Gates is related to the devil. That masks can kill you. That germ theory isn't real. And that there might be something to Pizzagate after all. Though all of that may seem so outlandish, it's not even worthy of our attention. A couple things make it exceptionally relevant for us today. One is that followers of QAnon are starting to run for public office. Over 70 QAnon supporters ran for Congress as Republicans this year, and at least one person who won her Republican primary in a very red district will likely be elected to Congress. The other reason this is relevant is that the meta narrative to every conspiracy theory within this group is that Donald Trump is not just a hero, but really a savior of our country. He is the only one who can stop the powerful democratic cannibalistic pedophiles. Remember when Trump said he could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and people would still support him? QAnon is the group that will support him. Calling QAnon cult-like followers of Trump does not overstate the situation. Journalist Adrian LaFrance writing for The Atlantic back in June, so this is not just happening this month, but it's been developing. She writes, to look at QAnon is to see not just a conspiracy theory, but the birth of a new religion. 
Not only is Q a person with followers who refer to him as a prophet, but the followers of Q eagerly await these internet posts, which are known as Q drops, so they can decipher them for hidden messages. Some even look for hidden Q messages within Trump's tweets, even resorting to numerology in which they assign numerical values to the letters he capitalizes. And he always capitalizes something. So back to Caitlin Beatty's work for Religious News Services, she documents the spread of QAnon, QAnon among, wait for it, white evangelical churches. She interviewed several pastors who are seeing their church members spreading this material on their social media posts. Some pastors are embracing it. Some are very worried and feel powerless to stop it or to convince their congregation of that it's a false narrative. Uh, Beatty writes this, QAnon is more than a political ideology. It's a spiritual worldview that co-ops many Christian sounding ideas to promote verifiably false claims about actual human beings. And that is key to what we're gonna talk about today. These are verifiably false claims about real people. QAnon has features akin to syncretism, she writes, the practice of blending traditional Christian beliefs with other spiritual systems. Q explicitly uses Bible verses to urge adherents to stand firm against evil elites. One charismatic church based in Indiana hosts two-hour Sunday services showing how Bible prophecies confirm Q's messages. Its leaders tell the congregation to stop watching mainstream media, even conservative media, in favor of QAnon channels. Okay, are you scared yet? Why am I telling you this? Well, because as Christians, I think we need to be very aware of this group. I'm going to leave this picture up here for a while. It's going to be relevant for, for a little bit here. We need to be aware of this group, and we need to know what it stands for. We have to be able to speak thoughtfully, clearly, and intelligently about why this group is so problematic, at, le at least to avoid being lumped together with them, and at best, to try to stop them from gaining more power. We do need to be careful though. And this is where I wanna, this is where sort of Wendy's message comes in and I wanna talk. We need to be careful about how we criticize this group. We need to be critical because this group is not just an innocuous group of people who wear tinfoil hats on their heads to hear alien messages. Although as a side note, there's not really anything fundamentally different from believing that the metal wire in your face mask is picking up 5G control, mind control signals from the government and believing that wearing a tinfoil hat on your head allows you to hear alien messages. Those really aren't that significantly different. I guess some things never change. Don't put metal next to your head. But QAnon doesn't just believe things are things that other people consider you know, ridiculous, but much more troublesome is that they have a core element to their false uh, conspiracies. And these are lies about real people. Uh, this group wants real people in prison. They want, real, they want real people executed. There have been some examples of members of this group taking their, those goals into their own hands, even people showing up with guns to stop, the, um, stop something that Q, and not, that Q has identified as an evildoer. Um, now, the most recent shooting in Kenosha by the right-wing vigilante has not been linked to QAnon specifically. But that action is very similar to the kinds of actions that QAnon followers have committed in the past, causing the FBI to even name the group as a domestic terror threat. So we absolutely must criticize this group, but we have to be thoughtful about how we criticize it. It might be tempting to get distracted by the absurdity of their claims, to roll our eyes and say their beliefs and conspiracies are just ridiculous and insane and untethered to reality. But before we do that, remember what we just read in our Bible passage this morning, when the Apostle Paul is trying to make his case about what Christianity is all about, the Roman governor calls him insane, doesn't believe he's tethered to reality. So before we criticize, let's look inwardly at our Christian beliefs and what those might look like to outsiders and why outsiders might consider them absurd. Now, just to be clear, I'm intentionally going to phrase this in a way that outsiders might hear it from the Christian perspective. So what do Christians believe? We believe that 2,000 years ago, God became a human man by impregnating a human woman. God did, th did this because humanity needed to be punished by God, or perhaps because they were held captive by the devil. And God had to pay the devil a ransom so humanity could be set free. So God, in the form of the human God-man, 
resolved humanity's cosmic trouble by allowing himself to be tortured and executed, and then that fixed everything. Then the God-man, who was completely dead for three days, came back to life, and he walked around on earth for a while and showed people his wounds, and then he floated up into heaven. And then he sent his spirit down. He didn't come back. He sent a spirit down that caused people to understand foreign languages, to have ecstatic experiences, experiences, and to be nice. Uh, he didn't come back yet, but he is coming back very soon. We're just not sure when, and it could be a while. But eventually, some kind of final battle against the forces of evil will take place where those identified as, as evil will, will be vanquished, and a final judgment will take place after which those who are approved by the God-man will be allowed to worship him forever. In our passage today, we find the Apostle Paul on trial trying to explain this system of thought to a Roman governor who, as we said, calls him insane. And he's also trying to explain to a Jewish king why the Old Testament, which people have interpreted in one way for thousands of years, actually says the opposite of what everyone thought it said. And he, Paul, is one of the few that can explain it. His explanations are outlandish uh, to the Roman governor and to the Jewish king. They think he's insane. So that's a good clue that if we're going to call QAnon insane, and I think they're very dangerous, we just have to be clear about what we're criticizing and what we need to leave alone. We need to be careful to focus less on the tinfoil hats and more on the values and goals of the group, both the stated values and the underlying values. The stories they tell, the narratives, the conspiracies, they matter, but any narrative can be used to justify just about anything these days, and narratives are inherently fluid. It's hard to keep a narrative from changing and evolving over time. So we must evaluate any movement or any group or any spiritual path, not on the basis necessarily of their stories or their conspiracies or whatever, but on the basis of their values and their goals. With QAnon, there are two core values that make it especially dangerous. It's the belief that power should be consolidated into the hands of one man. This is really a cult of Trump. It is a group that has had enough of democracy and is ready for one strong man to impose their version of a world order, which happens to be racist, homophobic, and patriarchal. And then the second value is that the threat of violence against political opponents, um, whether it's mass arrests or heavily armed militias or vigilantes or executions, imposing their will through violence is essential to the values of this group. Those two values are behind everything that QAnon talks about, every conspiracy theory they have. Those two goals are what moves this group or any group from being a benign group of tinfoil hat wearers to even a benevolent religious movement, moves it from there to being dangerous to a lot of real people. To contrast these values and goals, let's look at the values and goals that we hold as a congregation and as a church. The, unlike QAnon, whose goals are sent by Q drops on the internet, our goals are created based on conversations conversations with our congregation, congreg conversations among our democratically elected session. We share the, we drafted these ideas, we shared them with the congregation, we got feedback. These are values not set in stone necessarily, but are the work of not a single person. They're the work of a community based on tradition. So as a congregation, as a community, we embrace values and virtues demonstrated in the life and teaching of Jesus and throughout the Bible, including selfless love as demonstrated by Jesus throughout his ministry and through his death on the cross. So we're connected to the story, but the value is key. The value that the story communicates to us is selfless love. Relational ministry that prioritizes listening and building relationships with others. Healing and restoration of God's creation liberation of all people held in bondage, whether by personal or social powers, and equality and equal opportunity for all people to enjoy the abundance of God's creation. So yeah, on the surface to the outside world, QAnon and Christians may both have pretty crazy stories. But if QAnon is beginning to qualify as a religious movement, we need to pay attention. Religious movements happen all the time, but in the end, it's our values and our goals that we must be clear about and are fundamentally different between us and this group. 
They're as different as night and day. They're as different as evil and good. Where they value the power of one man to impose his will, we value the power of divine love that was demonstrated by one man who gave his life. Where they value authoritarianism, we value democracy. Where they value violence as a tool to be celebrated, we see violence as something that should be minimized and even eliminated. So in this world where people can perceive reality in radically different ways, what do we stand for? And are we ready to state our values even when the person we're talking to can't agree with us on what's basically real? Our values are clear. Selfless love for others, the highest value we have. Stronger, loving relationships between diverse people, healing and restoration of God's creation, liberation for all held in bondage, and equality for every person, for every child of God on earth. Friends, we live in a world where the narratives we use that we used to take for granted can no longer be taken for granted. There's no longer any consensus on what is real and true, what is sane and insane. And I'm afraid that might get worse and not better. So in a world of competing perceptions of reality, we must be very clear, very articulate, and even very persuasive when it comes to our values, to the kind of world we wish to create, and to the love that must be at the center of that new world order. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom.